So I'd like to introduce a couple of key players here with me. Uh, I'm fortunate to have Evan Stuckless in the room. Evan is a 20-year veteran who's worked on some very large projects. He's got 20 years experience in courseware and instructional design. He's worked with Microsoft, Yahoo. He's worked on SAP implementations. He's got a ton of experience and a lot of scars, as we like to say. So Evan's going to join us and help, and help us out. He's our learning solutions manager. So Evan, say hello to everybody. Hi, folks. How you doing? Great. Thanks, Evan. And additionally, joining me here is Nick McMahon. Nick's our Vice President of Learning. Additionally, he's got a ton of learning experience, a wealth of knowledge, not just on the learning side, but on the global side. Introduction, Mr. McMahon. Hi, thanks, Scott. Excellent. Uh, without getting too much ado on that side, uh, I'm going to jump into the other piece of it, um, utilizing some new technology here on our side and kind of walk everybody through. I think the key for us is to try to get through a number of topics on technical trends, some best practice, and then as we mentioned, we've got some time at the end for Q&A, but we really encourage you to come up with as many questions as you can for us in terms of you know, the topics at hand, and we'll try to make this as interactive as possible. So with that said, um, we'll talk about some of the technical trends and challenges, we'll talk about some of the different issues, and we'll try to bring some real world examples, some experience we have, as well as leveraging a lot of the experience we have with our clients into this as well. So. First, uh, Nick, share with us. Talk to us. Yeah, I think from a learning perspective, you know, the trends that we see in the business environment, they have all sorts of impact. But from the ones that are really key to learning, I think one is um, the amount of agile um, in the marketplace. Everything's going to agile. So, you know, you see one big training we released every 18 months, maybe five years ago. It's just got faster, faster, and faster. Now, 60 to 80 percent of the product development teams are using some form of agile development, which means as you're creating learning for your content, you've constantly got to update it, renew it with new features, um, and process it in a very, very short time. Um, coupled with that, you're seeing a massive amount of differentiation in the workplace. You know, generational, you know, there's up to five generations, very, very different learning scales, very different capabilities, very different expectations when they come to the learning. Um, and you're also looking at an environment that's radically changed. So it's not just the, the learners that have changed, but it's the environment. People aren't stuck or tied to an office anymore. They want to do their learning just in time. They want to do it in their cars, on the train, just before they go to a customer. Um, and so, you know, that old sort of state office environment just doesn't work. And then the final trend that impacts learning, but it's been impacted learning for quite some time, is, is budgets haven't got any loosely, you know, like people aren't them like, we finally, we finally get it, we're going to invest properly, like it's, it's still tricky to find a budget, um, and that still drives, you know, a lot of the strategy and the approach of learning, you know, really, it's, it's still definitely about trying to get the most for your money. Well, I think the interesting piece there is, the, it, the development teams using Agile, they've been talking about it for years, but people are actually doing it now. Uh, yeah, with, with iterative development, they're really, really having features that are um, being, you know, defined very late in the process and, and incrementally improved. And while that's a fantastic model for, um, for user-centric design, uh, it poses a bunch of challenges to us learning professionals. Well, I think the other one, too, is it is really unprecedented to think about five generations in the workforce. That creates an interesting challenge in and of itself. So you add multiple factors and layers to this that make it really difficult. So talk about what that means for learning, Nick. Okay, so from a learning point of view, you know, you are, you know, you're in a highly volatile, you know, environment. So, you know, I remember way back when, you know, like you, you could really get in touch with your content, you could really have the time to digest it, understand it. You know, now things are happening all the time. There's new features, new product groups, new marketing initiatives, um, new processes and procedures to support data security. You know, but things are happening like all the time. So you've got, you've got to move everything into a real time highly volatile content environment. Um, also, you've got to consider a holistic end-to-end -end approach to learning. You've got to be able to go right from, you know, bringing that learner to the topic, you know, helping them understand it through to successful um, performance metric delivery. Um, and then provide, finally, is this diversity of content where you're, you know, you, you've got to think about layers of information going out. So as a learner, I can access what I want to know at that right time, but it's allowing me to access deeper, further information um, if that's my style, you know, from a multi-generational, from a cultural point of view. Because it's not just multi-generations, it's also global, um, you know, global cultural differences. 
And so, you know, with this massive, you know, I don't think any of this is, is new at this point, right, but it's just saying that the trends of what's happening in the 21st century learning environment, you know, one is this, you know, you've got this volatile real-time information, end-to-end -end requirements, you've got the massive diversity in learner basing, and you, you cannot forget that it's still got to be engaging. And I think sometimes you get so caught up with like trying to keep up with all these trends, you know, the engagement can go out the window. And, and so above all, you, you can't forget that. Well, I think the interesting part is, like you said, it's multi generational, but the diversity is at an all-time high as well, and the diversity just keeps increasing, especially from a global perspective, but also even in the groups, the diversity is changing. So generational increasing, diversity increasing, ethnicity, it's just getting to the point of, you know, uniqueness in every situation you're in. Yeah, dri driving to the customized learning environment, you know, some of the concepts we're going to be talking about based on these trends, you know, I, I think that's a big, a big way forward. Yeah. Um, so one of the ways that, that I have found a lot of success about, about thinking about and predicting, designing for, and evaluating training in a holistic entire way is really to, I've looked at um, Dr. William Talheimer came up with a model called the Learning Landscape Model. Um, he is a, a analyst who scours all of the, the educational journals, all of the educational technology, adult learning theory papers, and really scours through all of those papers to find um, really the important and overarching uh, best practices for our, for our profession. And this landscape model is, is fantastic at being able to really understand how we can holistically support the whole thing. Um, from first, the, the first column in a training intervention with, with learning, um, this is where we do our traditional um, whether it be a, a classroom, virtual classroom, e-learning, uh, learning training intervention. And what we need to do is make sure that it hooks up with the performance situation, which is next. We need to make sure that, that our, our learners can perform when they're actually on the job. And then finally, we need to look at the results, both from an organization and also from an individual. What are those outcomes that, that um, how did we improve those outcomes as a result of our, our training um, efforts? But we also have to realize that there's more to just learning and linking to on-the-job performance. Really what we need to do is when people are back at their desks, when they're working with, with the, the application or they're, they're in the field uh, working with, with a new system, they need to be able to remember what that content uh, was. So we need to provide them mechanisms to remember. We also need to provide prompting mechanisms, job aids, uh, checklists, different, different sorts of uh, performance support that allow them to cue into their environment and actually, once again, be able to perform these techni highly technical tasks once they get back to their, uh, when they get back to their desk. And one of the other pieces that we really need to also include when we think about our whole learning landscape, our, our model, is on-the-job, just-in-time learning. And when we look at it, really, this is the, this is the category where most of our learners' uh, learning takes place, is actually on-the-job, back, working with um, shadowing with their peers, coaching with their, their managers, using um, different uh, performance support help systems. So, with this, when you use all of these modalities, both our traditional learning objects, the remembering mechanisms, prompting mechanisms, and on the job, you can really actually begin to measure and really depend on the results. So we're going to touch back on this learning landscape model a bunch of times, but I, I very much encourage you to go take a look. You'll find a lot of information up there on it, and um, it, it's a fantastic resource. So one of the things I'm going to try to do now is I'm getting back to this. Is um, apologize for pausing that for just a second. I'm going to actually launch one of our polls here for us for the team to look at. So while I'm doing that, um, I'm going to actually launch a poll. When it comes to uh, doing that, hang on just a second here for it. Uh, I'm going to launch a poll that talks about attendees and what you can see. So when when you're out there, what what is the biggest challenge? Uh, when it comes to technical training? Is it meeting the turnaround requirements? Is it the subject matter expertise responsiveness? Is it updating programs? 
Is it getting access to the application and the data that shows the features or the IT infrastructures? Uh, what is it that the biggest challenge that people are facing? So we're going to give people time to actually review that uh, and look at that. So right now we've got a number of people actually reviewing that poll. And Evan, while they're doing that, maybe you can kind of feature in what is the difference really between, um, you know, that you've seen? Is, is subject matter expertise, you know, is, are you still seeing that as the biggest piece there? Well, I think the biggest change that I've seen over the last, say, five, six years is um, it, it used to be that you would go in and you'd look at requirements documents. Somebody, somebody would hand out some specs. You would have uh, you know, a good chunk of time to be able to really sit down with those. Um, the other side is that, that the user documentation is also often complete by the time training gets, gets involved. Um, but now, with iterative development, agile systems, um, you just, I found that you just don't have that, that the specifications are, are really being built almost on the fly. Um, and the user, the, the technical writers who you depend on to provide those um, are uh, often just at the same spot as you, trying to learn the new systems and new, learn the new features. Well, it's interesting. So if we look at the poll here, I gave everybody a pretty good time on that. Um, let me share the results of the poll there for everybody to see. So from a standpoint of who was on the poll, uh, not surprisingly, subject matter expertise responsive voice was number one. But interesting look, if you look at it, meeting turnaround requirements, getting access to the data, and IT infrastructure tied all for the secondary spot. So it's kind of interesting. It's a bit of a shift. You know, historically, subject matter expertise you know, was probably the number one spot from responsiveness. But it's starting to pancake out a little bit across the board. So we're getting pulled in all kinds of directions here. It's not horribly. Go ahead, Evan. Uh, if I can speak to one, to one thing, and, and uh, I think that getting access to the, to the app with the appropriate data, that, that is always a challenge, um, and it, it's increasingly becoming so. So we'll go ahead and take a look uh, later on about what some strategies to be able to, um, to, to get in the game a little bit earlier with that. Well, let's, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about some of the best practices based on some of that data and, and some of the supporting performances on some of that. So, you know, talk about rapid development tools. And I know we're flying through some of that, but building on some of that, uh, I think most everybody on the, on the call is going to be familiar with the tool sets. But talk about what's going on out there, Evan, from a tool uh, perspective. Sure thing. Um, again, we, you know, uh, perhaps five, ten years ago, there was a, there was a, definite uh, de waterfall development cycle where instructional designers would create a storyboard, they'd create a script, and then they would hand it off to courseware developers to do their magic and, and provide the interactivity. Um, one of, with this increased speed, I think that, that there's increased uh, responsibility on the, on the part of instructional designers to use, the, use rapid, rapid uh, development tools to be able to create content themselves. This is, this is a big shift. It, it, it really it, it makes um, our instructional designers need to be think, think graphically. They become interaction designers. Um, they also are working with the, the, the traditional chunking of content and making sure that, that things are uh, you know, well written and well, well constructed. Um, but the nice thing about these, these rapid development tools is that you can really get into some, some fast, mod, quick learning module development that can uh, just in time really be able to get out that information uh, quickly and be able to respond to the, the changing features or the changing engineering specs. Yeah, one, one thing I'd add on this too is like this is an area that's changed a lot. So I think even in the last six months or so, there's an awful lot of development dollars going into these applications and products. You know, with this agile, it always takes software a little bit of time to catch up with the needs of the learning environment and learning community, but these tools really are coming a long way. So like, I feel like, you know, about a year, two years ago, we started to use them. They're a bit tricky, you know, like they, they didn't really cover everything, but really recently, some of these tools have got really, really advanced, much better functionality, much better flexibility. And so if you haven't had a look at, you know, these rapid development tools recently, it's a good time to go back to them. And another thing that we are sort of seeing is that the, the unison of these rapid development tools with things like mobile environments. For sure, yeah, especially with the introduction of mobile, but the adoption rates cleaned up, and then mobile, everybody keeps talking about, but now, you know, it's almost like agile. It's become a reality um, and an inevitability for everyone as well. Um, well, let's, let's uh, add another best practice to this with 
um, using our, I, I used to say international, but I think that, you know, we'll use our scrum rugby analogy here. Um, uh, early uh, ID subject matter expert, how many acronyms can I put in one sentence here, Evan? <laughs> ID, SME, eliminate duplication weight, <laughs> scrum, rugby analogy. Sure thing, sure thing. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, agile scrums are really when, when you know, it's a huddle in the, huddle in the morning or where, where people really level set on the user story, on being able to, 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 to create um, the, the feature changes and to iteratively improve whatever uh, product that that's the program that they're on. Um, and what you, what you find is that if you can get your instructional designers really in that process, really to be understand, to be part of and a value added part of that process, what you'll find is that um, really agile development d depends very much on user stories. And a, as a user story, basically you're going to say, as a, in this role, I want to do this. Well, if you switch around that, that, that phrase a little bit, you can really actually come up with learning objectives. In other words, at course completion, the whatever role will be able to do whatever that thing is. So there really, there's a lot of, a, a lot of um, the symmetry. There's a lot of, there's a lot of ability to leverage out those user, use cases and user stories um, for instructional design. Going even further, uh, interaction designers create the whatever um, uh, pieces that are that are involved in seeing out and fleshing out those features, and then quality assurance writes test scripts against that functionality, that proposed functionality, well, quality assurance, when they create a test script, it looks something very similar to um, an info mapping style user guide. So they're creating that, that content once, then the technical writers will go ahead and work with that information, they'll write it again, and then finally, uh, learning, learning and training developers will take that information and put it into a, a scenario or a simulation or a demo. And I, I think one, one of the things that you can realize is that there's a lot of duplication of effort in here. Um, there's a lot that, that, that um, quality assurance, the testing folks, can, can really add to uh, help learning be able to be on the same page. So again, if you can get your, your IDs really in that process early, what it ends up doing is it turns into making your ID as an SME. And they become very knowledgeable about the product. They can really position it. They know how to, um, they know how to best give out that information. So um, you can find a lot of benefit, uh, not only to the learning side of it, but also to the development side. We, we have a lot of skills that we can bring to the table. Yeah, it sounds like the trick is you know, to get your ID into that Scrum early and then to add the business value and make sure you get invited back to the Scrum, right? Yeah. You don't want to get kicked out because you're you're not adding business value, right? And it sounds easy to say, but sometimes hard to do. Yes, um, and really, one of the best ways that you can do that is by providing standards and style guides, if if, if necessary, and really make sure that everybody is working on the same page with the same uh, set of uh, of requirements. Well, I think the, the the next best practice is, and I'm, I know we're flying through some content here, and I'm going to share. I'm going to do another poll here in just a second, but I think before we get there. Talk about that, though, from a from a template and shell standpoint, um, and we're going to throw in some more, you know, industry verbiage here, Evan. Though, but bring in some shells to this. Sure thing, sure thing. Um, really, modularized content is it, it's nothing new. Um, it's it's been around for about ten years, and uh, really, it it speaks to again having uh, creating content that can be used across that whole landscape that we saw earlier. Um, by, you, by working with um, learning objects or uh, quick learning modules, you can really do two things. One, you can put them into a learning path that covers the end-to-end -end training that comes along with onboarding people that really gives them the whole, the whole piece of what they need to, to know. However, when a feature on a given, uh, on a given uh, page changes, if you have those uh, with, a, with a good taxonomy, with good strong terminal learning objectives, you know exactly where you need to go to, do, to update that content. And by, you can often just by updating one or two modules, you can do two things. One, give out that new feature information, 
and two, you're also maintaining your end-to-end -end training and your, uh, your, your onboarding training. So um, really by using these modular, modular objects, often developed with these rapid, tool, rapid development tools, um, you can really get, speak to that efficiency and be able to, to uh, both address a whole program as well as specific feature changes. Well, like a, so templates and shells, that makes sense to, you know, so you can update, reduce the cost, especially as you see that ever, you know, increasing, how am I going to say this right, in the right English vernacular here. So the rate of change is happening at a faster and faster rate, right? Yes. And the content is changing faster and faster, and the product releases are changing, and the rate of change on those releases is happening at a quicker rate. So having these templates in place and these shells in place to make it faster to do things, and as we see the the size of the courseware, you know, decreasing because they're trying to get, you know, smaller, more uh, consumable data chunks out there, right? So you've got all these factors hitting you. So the importance of templates and shells now is even becoming more important, right? Absolutely, it, it, it really is. And you know, again, with some of these rapid rapid development tools, that this does not mean that you have to forsake interactivity. It doesn't mean you have to forsake um, different kinds of engagement. But really, what it does mean is that that now more than ever. We real, as learning professionals, we really need to be learning objectives, performance competencies driven, and really know our instructional design at the core of these is, um, is valid. Okay, so with that in mind, I'm launching back to you to the audience here. So what, is, what sources of information do you use to get that information that you need to use to update this information to create these courses? Are you out there? Are you using requirements documents? Are you getting other pro project documentation? Are you going to the SMEs, to the subject matter? Are you using user documentation? Are you going to wikis in the, in the categories? Where are you getting that data now? Has it changed dramatically? Has your story changed? Are you doing the same thing you've always done? Or things that we've done? Uh, this is the kind of thing I think we can add value to the other members of the webinar because we can kind of share this with everybody else out there. So I've got about 56% of you have voted, so those of you out there who can grab a click and help us, um, I'm going to share this here and see if there's any you know, huge epiphanies for those of you on the webinar, um, and we'll see if we can shock anybody with news here. Where would you put like wikis, Evan? What category would you put that in? Would you put it in an other use case? Where would um, you put it? Sure, yeah. yeah. That, uh, a wiki would really be um, some form of a knowledge man management tool, an informal learning um, environment. Where would you click for that one if you were answering the I guess I would say other. Other? Okay. All right. Well, I've got 75% of you, so I'm going to give you guys just a couple seconds here to finish out. Whoa. Thanks for listening. Everybody just hit all their click buttons. So let me close that poll here. For those of you, I'll give you just a couple seconds. We've got, I've got, wow, I've got a good attendance today, and pretty much everybody here is interacting. So let me close that here and share your results here for you. So as you guys can see, uh, probably not shocking to anybody out here that Subject matter experts are 54% of the results. So I don't think that's changed since 20 years ago when I was doing training myself, right? Um, still, 15% are doing it. Um, I would, you know, I would say that, that what I've seen is that this is this is becoming much more. I mean, you used to rely a lot on the requirements documents. Really, that that used to be the case. Um, but but now with this quick turnaround, really, that the, the subject matter expert walkthroughs are, are becoming you know, the, the, the primary uh, vector for, for getting out that information. And I suppose that depends on the kind of training you're doing as well. I know when we did the prep for this, you said, you know, if you're doing a sales training or a technical training, those, those vary based on what we're up to, right? Yes, absolutely. That makes sense. And it also makes sense, too, that the requirements documents may not, you know, by the time the requirements docs are written, it's already the training it's already it's done. Time to release, yeah. Right. So let's talk, Nick, maybe share the last best practice here or another best practice. Yeah, um, here is, it's sort of spacing, you know, so it's spacing your content and your budget. So we used to sort of think like RFPs that would come out and say like, okay, give me this module. Maybe it's an hour long, maybe it's 15 minutes. But everything, the focus is about just get this module, this learning content out of the door. What we're starting to see a move towards, and I think is a much better way to approach learning, is this more holistic end-to-end -end approach, where it's really, okay, give me a plan to learn across this subject for you know, an on, on an ongoing basis. Because that can't just be about that one module. It's got to be about refreshing, check-in, knowledge checks, reminders, repeat information. You're trying to expand out your content. Um, and at the same time, you're trying to expand out your budget. So you know, you're, you're spending smaller amounts of money frequently across a longer period of time. 
And I think that's getting a much better quality of learning result from a performance management perspective. I mean, this, this also plays in, with a, again, with the learning landscape model that we looked at earlier. By spacing out this content, both from that in, in, initial training intervention, then to uh, different, different uh, uh, strategies to improve retention, right. prompting, uh, on the job, informal, just we have a, a bigger uh, opportunity to use these different technologies, these different, different modes, and it actually provides much higher retention rates and, and much better training. Right, so you go back to Tom Meyer's Tom uh, uh, the landscape model. Landscape model. Thank you. Yeah, yeah and I think the, the, this, this best practice here about going global too, like this shouldn't be underestimated. Um, but, you know, we see, you know, 100% or greater cost differential between people that have effectively planned to take their learning global and people that haven't. You know, the cultural diversity, you know, within organizations is doing nothing but increasing. So as you're developing out this content, you know, you, you've got to bear in mind this global audience. Otherwise, you go to do the global, local part of it, and it's extremely expensive. So right. all of that agility, all of that spacing effect, you know, that we've been talking about, all of that planning grinds to a halt because suddenly you get the cost back for translating it and it's way too expensive. So now I'm like, well, I'm only going to do that once, you know, every three months. I'm only going to do that once every six months. And, and then you're not servicing a global audience. So you've got to plan for global up ahead. If you do plan, you can radically alter your cost. You can, you know, using things like the tools, the translation memory tools that are available, using effective planning and asset control, you know, you, you can make it much more feasible to, to extend that agility, to extend that spacing, you know, ongoing commitment to learning um, through the languages part of the global part of your learning as well. So it's almost like what Evan was talking about, getting the ID into the scrum early, kind of yeah. get that global thought process early. early into the process and it saves you immense amounts in the back end and makes it so you can do the translation when you get to that point. Yeah, absolutely. It's like ten ten dollars invested up front in your learning, whether it's global or getting them in the, the scrum early, is going to return, you know, in terms of saving and the ability to deliver more content cost effectively, like a thousand dollars up the back end. Like and just significant. And a touch point, I think the translation memory, just in a nutshell, what is that? Um, translation memory is just a way to store previous translations. So it's a tool that's used within the localization business. You know, so when from a learning perspective, it just means when I create a learning piece of content, I can reuse any translation I've already paid for when I update that learning content later. So a way to recycle the previous recycle, translation. Yeah. Yep, yeah. Nice. If I could jump in just really quickly here, one thing I, uh, that, that, that I've found and seen, seen significantly is that when you d write to a style that is conversational, active voice, um, concise, those very same things that, that uh, promote translatability and localization also promote learning. So it's a win-win. Good point. Yeah, we, we have a couple of Cisco folks on the, the line, but actually this is a prelude too, like next month, um, beginning of November, we're going to do a deeper dive on quick learning modules. And Cisco has been really a pioneer in this area. So we're taking all of these concepts about being agile, about multi-generational, about consistency of content, about rapid development. And the net business output there is quick learning. So here, this is regarding their firewall um, products. They've got a number of products coming out on an ongoing basis. Those products are totally in an agile environment. Yep. If you're trying to get a hold of an SME that is like, helping the learning group but also releasing the product and supporting marketing at the same time is extremely difficult. So we're going to do a whole webinar on this, but I think from takeaway point of view, you know, modular content for flexibility and efficiency, the way they've modularized their content, get into clear specific budget buckets that then can be built out into simplified limited learning goals, right? So I'm really pulling down a, the definitive hierarchy structure to, to get to my learning objectives. And then, interestingly enough, they've taken a role where they're starting to like contract out the ideas and SME. So their expectation as they interact with us is that our ID will know about cloud computing, know about right. virtual to cloud transactions, know about switches and routers. And that's a training endeavor that has to be done up front. But then it means that the SME can get on a call and say, okay, so in this instance, we've moved our cloud you know, capacity up to 10 gigs from 4 gigs. And, and the ID will know what that means can relate it back to the confirmed learning objectives. Got it. And um, so that, that, to me, is a very good example. And, and again, we're going to come back to this in a specific webinar at the beginning of November. But, but Cisco does a great job at, at you know, these quick learning modules and using you know, the ID resource as a joint sort of ID SME role.
Yeah, it's interesting how you take the and you sort of up level where you say the ID has to have the infrastructure and the subject matter expertise of the industry, um, which can be very technical at times, yeah. and then they use the subject matter expertise of the content from the supplier standpoint to actually build on the two. So the two work very, very closely together without in a rapid environment, right? Yeah, and you're talking about acronyms here, you know, when you get into this cloud yeah. infrastructure stuff, <laughs> like it makes our acronyms look weak. Right. Uh, yeah. W S A S A but the but the actual SME in Cisco needs to be able to hand off that information super quick to the ID. They can't afford the time to re educate the ID into the basic industry and then start talking feature. You you've got to be able to, you know, as an ID provision our ideas have to be able to interpret that information straight away so that the overall group can be successful. Great information. Good job at Cisco. And it's also a, a blatantly nice hook from your standpoint as well. So yeah, next month, yeah. it's, good, it's good for Cisco as well. Yeah. And Cisco is going to be on that call with us too, actually. They'll, have They'll be co-presenting with yeah. us yeah, next month. So stay tuned. We can actually send out a reminder for that for those of you interested in that one as well. And I think you can summarize this for us there, Nick. So it's, I can see the key to success. Everybody will yeah. detail that. So, Quick, you know, modular building blocks, you know, are the, are the key. Um, you know, don't forget engaging, but like create quick, specific modular building blocks. You know, leverage the tools and mechanisms out there, and then make sure that you're getting both, you know, the global concepts and the ID concepts involved as far up the life cycle as you possibly can. Yeah. You know, there's not enough time in the life cycle anymore to like retrain later on. Get the value of the ID and the value of the preparation right from day one of developing content. So encourage your groups, you know, your internal customers, get me involved in day one. It's going to be more valuable. You know, help me plan over a longer term life cycle where I'm going to touch your learners in multiple areas. Um, let me plan for being global if we're going to do a global release from day one. So get everything up front. Make your investment up front, and you'll, you'll, you'll have huge dividends um, from a learning point of view um, on the back end. Brilliant. Okay. Well, I think from our standpoint, you know, we had a pretty heavy agenda with a few questions that came up in between the two. I think we've answered most of the questions that came up during the webinar to those individuals that came up. We're also available for those afterwards. Um, we've got a few resources for those of you who are here and, and are interested. Um, we've got some uh, game on. There's some game-based uh, micro-learning in effects. We've got some multi-generational uh, learning on our website as well. Um, and as we mentioned at the beginning of this, we will make this available for others, and we're also available for questions or for any of the content we, discuss, we discussed today. Those are also available, um, plus any of the other courses. And we'll actually uh, make this available to rebroadcast and available um, for anybody else who's interested as well. Uh, I'd like to thank Evan and for those of you who attended today. If there's any questions or anything else we can do, feel free to email or back to the same way you came in through or back to the website. And thanks again for joining us. Thanks to Evan. Thanks to Nick. And with that said, uh, we'll see you again next time. As Nick mentioned, we've got the, uh, the next uh, session with Cisco coming up uh, the first part of November. And we hope everybody has a great day and a great week. Happy learning, everybody.